Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. In this episode, we'll be looking at the latest developments in, as well as the future of, the international economic order. We'll examine how the U.S. and European Union are contending with China, and what the influence of rising powers like Brazil, Russia, India, and China mean for the rules of international trade and finance. Joining us for our discussion today, we're pleased to have two experts. First, Professor William Burke White, a professor of law here at Penn Law and the inaugural director of Penn's Perry World House. Also with us is Christopher Brummer, a professor of law at Georgetown University, who also directs Georgetown's Institute of International Economic Law. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us, and let's get right down to it. If we could begin, please, by defining our terms. What do we mean when we talk about the international economic order? Yeah, so part of the challenge here is that international economic order can refer to a lot of different things. Uh, one thing it refers to is the construct of institutions created in uh, the wake of World War II uh, under U.S. leadership that uh, began to create the international trading system and much of the international financial system. Uh, it also, however, can refer to kind of the current state of global economic affairs, um, and that is often derivative of the kind of system of rules and institutions, uh, but is actually really a reference to kind of what's happening in the world markets today and how they operate. Great. So with that in mind, we're hearing a lot about China's new trade agreements in Asia and the U.S. and the European Union's trade agreements um, seem to be positioned to compete with China as a world economic actor. Uh, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about these trade regimes and what they are and what the implications are of them? Well, I think you can look at it as really the uh, continuation of a process that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, there are, when you talk about trade, both economic and political drivers behind any uh, uh, trade agreement or any system of trade agreements. And what we've seen uh, from a bird's eye view is that the global economic order for trade, which has traditionally centered around the WTO, is showing signs of stress. And uh, one of the results of the stress, as governments are increasingly uh, unable to agree on certain kinds of non-tariff barriers, that is, you know, as countries have agreed on how to remove taxes, there are other kinds of things that can uh, ultimately increase the, the cost of goods and services that have come into play and that involve the regulatory state. And people tend to disagree, particularly when they are um, uh, situated along different lines of economic development. And as this, in turn, has happened, you've had a fracturing, and uh, folks have opted into either regional or bilateral trade agreements, basically to cut out the number of actors to uh, uh, secure a more efficient agreement uh, with fewer people around the bargaining table. Now, uh, this, in turn, uh, multiplies not only the number of treaties, but their flavor, their substance, uh, and their both political and economic and even strategic implications. And what we've seen in the United States is a turn to more regional and bilateral treaties. And what you've seen in China is a game of catch up, uh, uh, catching up with the kinds of uh, uh, partnerships that the United States has been actively pursuing since uh, the 1940s, and also to take its own uh, step forward in its own unique way in both the Pacific Rim and with some of its own major trading partners uh, scattered across the world. So what are these two competing agreements? Can we just break this down a little bit? Sure. So um, if you uh, listen to President Obama or the U.S. Trade Representative Mike Froman, they'll start by saying these are not competing agreements. The U.S. and China are not in competition here. But then they'll put a comma after that and say, but the real question is who gets to define the future shape of the international economic and trade order, which sounds a lot like competition to me. Um, the U.S. put forward a, a vision of an international trade and investment agreement in the Asia Pacific called the Trans Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Um, and China has put forward something called the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, what's interesting is these are not directly competing and that states can be a member of both of them if they want to. But they are quite substantively different regimes. First of all, the U.S. has said we don't want to be part of the RCEP, the Chinese-led one. And China said they don't want to be part of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific U.S.-led partnership. Um, but the TPP is a much deeper uh, agreement. It involves deeper sort of structural changes changes in national economies. Uh, the U.S. says it's about better trade as well as more trade. China's agreement is thinner but broader. It brings in more states. The U.S. agreement has 11 states. The Chinese agreement is, is a bigger agreement, uh, but does less to change how economies work and less to sort of liberalize trade. Mm -hmm. So are there differences in terms of who are the partners for each? 
Uh, there's overlap, but also differences. So uh, the U.S. Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, is a weird conglomeration of states because it crosses the Pacific Ocean. So it's the U.S. and Chile, uh, as well as Vietnam and Australia. Uh, the Chinese agreement is more focused in the Southeast Asian uh, region, um, but doesn't, for therefore, for example, reach out to some of the countries in the Western Hemisphere that we include. So we define the region slightly differently. Uh, but the U.S.-led agreement is really one that has much more open economy economies, then it's countries like Vietnam that find themselves at the border between the two agreements and have to decide if they do both, if they join the U.S. or, or the Chinese-led version. Uh, and those countries are at the moment saying, we want to do both. We want to balance between China and the U.S. and be involved in both trade regimes. Great. So uh, just to step back again for a moment, where does the law fit into all this in terms of the mechanics of how these regimes work? What, for example, with each agreement, are countries signing on to if they're part of one or both regimes? And legally speaking, what does that mean? So let me, let me start, and then I want to hand it over to Chris on a piece of this. But I want to actually take us back um, 60 years. Uh, the international economic order began as a highly legalized order based on institutions that were created after World War II. Um, the uh, GATT, the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, for example, uh, the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund. These are institutions created by law. States signed a treaty to join them, and they had a great deal of power to regulate the international economic system. Uh, they controlled trade liberalization, they resolved trade disputes, they helped provide financing uh, for governments as they entered into the sort of post-war development era. Um, and the system was largely uh, defined by legal institutions and legal rules. Uh, what we've seen, and this is where I really want to hand it over to Chris, is uh, a breakdown in the formalization of that legal order and a much more fluid system. So maybe, Chris, you can pick up the historical narrative. So I, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. You know, um, what you can really uh, say is that uh, the classic multilateral system that you saw emerging from the Bretton Woods agreements had sort of three key characteristics. Um, number one, um, as Bill has rightly identified, is the fact that agreements and the institutions uh, uh, pushing those agreements were highly formalized. They were recognized under international law as uh, internationally and legally binding. Uh, they were real international organizations that were created. Um, and now you're seeing uh, the proliferation of not so binding accords and at times explicitly non-binding accords. The other uh, feature of, if one will, of the post-war international system was at least an aspiration towards universalism. Mm -hmm. And here, by definition, when you look at different kinds of groups and collectivities and partnerships, you're seeing uh, a decaying of that particular feature. And then the last feature was that the post-war system was largely anchored in uh, the U.S. dollar. Uh, and the dominance of the U.S. dollar. And again, when you look at TPP and particularly China's efforts uh, to globalize its not only its, its uh, trade in goods, but ultimately its trade in services, you have more uh, of an alternative uh, uh, mindset as to the proliferation of their own domestic currency. But uh, when you get to that first question, or excuse me, the second question as to the regional agreements and the legality question, uh, a regional agreement itself operates in the interstices, in the gaps, if one will, of the international rules established under the WTO. That but basically there's an exception under Article 24 that allows countries to create trade agreements so long as they comply with certain kinds of core standards, one of which is the presumption that that trade agreement will provide not so much a, a, a stumbling block to greater global liberalization, but instead is more of a stepping stone to, to getting it accomplished. Right. Just to put it in more concrete terms for folks who either aren't international lawyers or students of international relations, when you talk about the post-World War II order, you're talking about, well, some features of that include the World Trade Organizations, Absolutely. where if two countries have a dispute, it goes to the WTO, and they help to mediate those disputes or arbitrate. World Bank, IMF, international institutions like that, as well as other features and mechanisms and That's, so forth. And then you're talking about the new regional ones, which are obviously, as you say, they operate, as you say, in the gaps to some extent. Right. That, that effectively, this, this multilateral system is increasingly being characterized by a minilateral system. Uh, a lot less formal, much more fractioned, uh, and, and, and also uh, uh, less reliance, if one will, or, or a less dollar-centric uh, strategic orientation. And that's what you're seeing and from an international lawyer standpoint and for our students' standpoint. Uh, part of our work is to uh, push them to understand what this means for their careers um, as the classic multilateral system is undergoing uh, this dynamic change. 
Right. So we've talked a little bit about the mechanics of uh, international law and agreements, but what about what I think what you call soft law in this area, norms? In other words, behavior that is perhaps not defined by law or is sort of perhaps out of the realm of enfor enforcement per se. Right. You know, uh, uh, soft law, again, you know, as, as I've traditionally looked at it as someone who's focused on international financial regulation, is the proliferation of a range of accords. Some may have heard of, say, the Basel III Accord for, for, for global uh, uh, banks or the G20 or the Financial Stability Board, these new organizations that don't have any formal uh, legally recognized basis. They don't push rules or laws or mandates that are uh, recognized as international accords under the Vienna Convention. In fact, they're explicitly said to be non-binding, but yet there are institutional mechanisms that undergird them that have uh, some enforcement capability, and often they rely on the markets themselves to, uh, they, they leverage the markets in ways such as to enforce or to increase the bindingness of those uh, non-binding soft law uh, accords. Now, the trade agreements are more, uh, uh, really what you see is, is more of a kind of minilateral uh, partnership and strategic alliances, uh, but there are and have always been, even in the trade space, uh, certain kinds of accords that are not always enforceable or where the enforcement mechanisms are weak. Certainly, when you look at the first generation of the GATT before it evolved into the WTO that we know today with the kinds of dispute uh, mechanisms and binding uh, uh, mechanisms uh, allowing states to sort of punish one another for not falling through on their international commitments, export controls and the like. Uh, but you are seeing uh, as the global economy uh, moves from an emphasis on the trade of good of goods uh, to this question of trade and services and monetary affairs and financial instability, you are certainly seeing other kinds of tools, a, diver a diversification really of the instruments of international economic diplomacy that are driving a lot of today's uh, statecraft. Mm -hmm. So just to pull that string a bit, how much, uh, or to what extent rather, are these international trade re regimes instruments of diplomacy versus influence of economics? Yeah, I, I guess I would start by saying this is about more than trade. It's trade, it's money, it's investment, and they all are interrelated. Um, and what we've seen is a real movement from a kind of very formalized legal system to a world of multiple but not global legal regimes and lots of non-formal legal rules. And oftentimes when the international economic order gets criticized for being perhaps not transparent, people can't quite understand it, it's all of these non-formal legal rules because they're things states do not totally out of diplomacy, often out of a kind of leverage that flows from the system itself. If you run a bank and you want your bank to be able to work with other banks around the world, you better comply with the Basel III standard. So even though it's not binding on governments, it has enormous coercive power, if you will. So it's about moving from a world of legal power to a world where the economic order creates its own leverage to drive compliance with these rules that were agreed to but never formally made into law, if that... By definition, regulators in the financial space agree to an international rule, if one will, uh, maybe in Basel, Switzerland, or in Madrid, uh, Spain, for the International Organization of Securities Commissions. And once they, they, they opt into a regime, they all promise to do their best to basically uh, craft domestic rules and standards that reflect these best practices internationally. And what we see in the United States is treaty practice, you know, going through the legislature is increasingly being disintermediated by administrative practice. That is, you rely more on the Administrative Procedure Act to secure an international and to comply with international soft law mandates than you are necessarily through a kind of traditional 20th century uh, uh, treaty process. At the same time, though, you know, the question of transparency, because it's, it's, it's hard, uh, you know, independent agencies don't always practice the kind of transparency that, that one would like, particularly at the international level. But there are also some of the same kinds of concerns that uh, are pervasive even when you continue to rely on your traditional uh, trade instruments and formal trade instruments. You know, if you talk about the TPP today, the question isn't only about getting access to the formal terms of the agreement, but you know, what's in the side letters between the different actors? What kinds of side arrangements and deals have been agreed to? 
what are the compliance mechanisms behind those side agreements? Mm -hmm. You know, in order to get a, a, a fully expansive sense as to what kinds of commitments and what kinds of obligations are now driving this new uh, system of international commitments. And you know, transparency is always difficult because you have to have actors like uh, senior government officials like Bill Burke White when he was over in the State Department to help you negotiate a deal with some degree of anonymity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you also need uh, uh, enough transparency for particularly those democratic states that are participating in the system to be able to share uh, the costs and benefits of uh, the arrangements with their local stakeholders and citizenry. Mm -hmm. So you talked before about the U.S. being the global currency after World War II. And we're hearing more about China's currency, the RMB, being internationalized. What is the status of that, uh, Chris, and what are the implications of it? So there are various stories, um, uh, the most important of which is to say that China is the second largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. It's the leading trading nation in the world. And once it decided uh, to use that currency uh, to allow its own people to use the currency for uh, both their domestic banking uh, outside of China in Hong Kong and also to use that currency for the payment of goods, you liberalize what is the current account. And by internationalizing the current account, you catapult it, if one will, the currency into a new realm of international stature for international mm -hmm. payments. Now, internationalizing uh, uh, the currency for buying goods isn't always the same thing as internationalizing the currency for the purposes of financial services, which is considered a key aspect of determining um, how important any particular global currency is. So where we are now is in a, is in a process of trying to uh, 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 get our arms around a new regulatory and market infrastructure that is designed to effectively export the renminbi for capital account purposes, that is for the investment in stocks and bonds and different kinds of uh, 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 banking instruments and derivatives and the like. And the question is, how do you set up an infrastructure to support uh, really an unprecedented uh, attempt to internationalize a, a currency um, uh, that is tied to a very unique economy such as China's. And, and uh, we're seeing lots of questions uh, relating to that process uh, that's sprouted up, uh, obviously with the devaluation of the currency recently, but yet at the same time as the continuation of the, of the ascendance of the currency in payments uh, continues to unfold. Steve, can I let me try to boil this down in, in, a, in a little more concrete terms. So for most of the last 75 years or so, the U.S. dollar has been the world's reserve currency. What that means is if the Chinese wanted to buy oil from the Saudis, they paid for it in dollars. It was priced in dollars. And that gave the United States extraordinary power in the international system because we could essentially print money because the rest of the world depended on our money to resolve their debts at the end of the day. And what uh, Chris is telling us a story about is the RMB beginning to be an alternative player. You can only be an alternative reserve currency if your currency is truly internationalized. If people all over the world can use it, if they trust that it's going to still have value, um, and if the other side is willing to take it when you offer it up. And in order to get there, the Chinese have to go through what Chris has just described, which is this process of opening their currency to the world. If they do so successfully, that has real consequences for the United States because it limits our ability to be the only reserve currency and to be the only country that can really set the reserve price of money, if you will, that can determine the global value of money and therefore have leverage over everybody else. So it's technical in its implementation. It's extraordinarily powerful in its result. And you know what's really important about it is, just like it is in the world of trade, it has not only uh, a monetary dimension, but it has a political and an economic dimension and a regulatory dimension as well. So what Bill has just explained is the fact that if you internationalize the currency, if you create another alternative reserve currency, it impacts the way in which we borrow our money. It, it, it complicates the transmission of monetary policy in the United States, um, uh, the cost of or the kinds of interest rates that we set. But it also complicates other things as well. It complicates how uh, the transmission of global regulatory policy. You know, we in the United States, we've traditionally had the largest and most liquid capital markets. If you want to come to, if you want to raise a whole lot of money, traditionally, you either had to come to the United States or to London. To the extent to which you internationalize the currency and you open up the world's biggest 
a country of savers to the rest of the world, you're now dramatically changing how investment dollars flow across the world. But you're also, by creating an infrastructure to support that process, you're now creating new stakeholders in questions of global banking regulation, new stakeholders in the global securities markets. And the questions that are going to arise in the future as internationalization eventually unfolds is how do our own legal processes in the West conflict with or uh, complement the regulatory oversight and market supervision in China. You know, do they agree? You know, will our SEC agree with the Chinese securities regulators or not? Are they going to adopt the same rules? And then finally, on economic or speaking on foreign policy, you know, the way in which we choose to do things, core aspects of our national security often impact and dovetail with our banking system. Now, when we want to sanction a foreign actor, more often than probably any other instrument is sanctioning their banking system. You know, if you can sanction another country's access to funding, you are able to bend the curve, if one will, on certain aspects of foreign policy. And we've just seen this with Russia. When, our, you know, when the U.S. put on sanctions on Russia, the impact on their banking sector was the most vulnerable place and the one that produced the most ser serious consequences. And the messaging systems for, this, for the banking system are, is swift, uh, a kind of in, an international system for how banks communicate with one another. And that is tied largely, for, to make a long story short, to the U.S. banking regulatory system. If you can create, for example, another alternative currency uh, um, that either circumvents the U.S. Uh, banking system, or if you can create other kinds of infrastructure to support banking that doesn't necessarily rely on the uh, existing global standards uh, or the U.S. dominated uh, uh, global standards, you're now creating alternative paths by which other countries can either avoid our sanctions or to, frankly, other paths in which they can impose their own sanctions on U.S. actors, which would be an unprecedented um, uh, capacity in foreign policy. Now, we're quite a ways away from that world, but it's not a world that uh, senior policy officials uh, uh, in Europe and the United States have not been actively at least considering and contemplating. So could we just talk for a moment about the regulation of currency and finance. So I think in the domestic context, most people can understand that we have domestic financial regulators, the SEC and so forth. But on the international stage, who does international financial or currency regulation? Is it an inter intergovernmental organization? Is it a network of central bankers domestically? How does it work for folks who are not intimately aware of uh, international finance or banking? So one of the interesting developments and complicated developments, and one of the challenges in particular for international lawyers in the future, mm -hmm. is that when it comes to finance, when it comes to money, as opposed to having, as in the 1940s, at least some sense of an epicenter for where the action is going, uh, you have a highly fragmented system for regulating international finance. Um, uh, even when you look at the TPP and TTIP and other regulations, at least you know that you're operating within the, the pocket of space that's been provided to under the WTO or, and, and under the GATT. When it comes to soft law institutions where you don't have a legal mandate, you effectively have a world in which the G20 is setting broad a broad agenda for a variety of economic matters. The top 20 world economies. The, the largest 20 uh, economies uh, and the European Union are sort of setting the stage, uh, setting expectations about what they want to see from market participants and, uh, and regulators and finance officials. And then you have other kinds of players, for example, in international financial regulation itself, this financial stability board, which is really a clearinghouse of all kinds of international organizations that themselves consist of, uh, you know, I, I tell my students, uh, I say it's kind of like the Galactic Senate, Senate in, uh, in Star Wars, you know. We need uh, one of those. <laughs> we, we, well, that, that would be the Financial Stability Board. And, and, and you have different uh, organizations such as the, the Basel Committee for all the uh, bank, central bankers meet to discuss uh, how you are going to regulate banks. Uh, you have uh, uh, International Organization of Securities Commissions, which I had referenced earlier, where the SEC and its international counterparts talk about how you regulate market participants and securities firms. There's another one for insurance companies, or excuse me, for insurance firms, and accounting uh, auditors and the like. And, uh, and then finally, the, the important stage, getting back again to our earlier conversation, you have the implementation on the ground, where the participants in these international uh, for come back home and they work to comply with these international best standards. And then finally, 
I guess there's the monitoring regime. Sometimes it's done within those international bodies, including the Galactic Senate of the Financial Stability Board. And then sometimes the monitoring is done uh, by the old school institutions of the World Bank and the IMF. There's something called the Financial Sector Assessment Program in which uh, uh, individuals uh, will evaluate the rules that are on the books of some major uh, systemically important jurisdictions and see whether or not those uh, uh, legal regimes and to a certain extent supervisory regimes really uh, pass muster at the international level. But it's, it's, it's highly complicated but extremely important. So I want to tease out uh, some tensions in what Chris has just given us. In a way, you've given us a kind of alphabet soup of institutions that are now involved in regulating this space. Um, but there, that leads to a real tension between effectiveness and legitimacy. Um, we have developed, or I guess no one has developed it, it's just sort of come into existence, this, this set of structures, and they're actually pretty effective. They work pretty well, um, partly because everybody has the right incentives in, in those structures. Banks don't want to violate rules because they want their banks to be effective. And so forth. But then you get this legitimacy question. And this is what we hear a lot about in the U.S. and European politics today. Who created this? Where did they get the authority to do so? Where did they get the right to do so? Who's monitoring the monitors, if you will? Um, and that's a real question, because international law's uh, legitimacy flows essentially from participation. It's all about the fact that everybody has one vote and everybody's sitting at the table and you reach an agreement. And this is a system where everybody doesn't have one vote. It's about how big your economy is, how influential your economic institutions are. Um, and that does lead to very effective outcomes, but it leads to also some groups being excluded from the system and a lot of people criticizing the fact that there is no kind of participatory legitimacy to the system. Can I make the, the observation though, and what I found particularly uh, interesting when you look at uh, the process by which we've been negotiating TPP and TTIP is that you still have those same concerns. I mean, when you go back to Seattle and the criticisms of the World Bank and the IMF, you know, you've had a, a more distrust, frankly, of the global economic order writ large, whether or not it be a formalized system resting on uh, uh, treaties and international agreements that have been mainstays uh, for over half a century or really when you shift into a new world of treaty making, or excuse me, of, of economic agreements that uh, may not always rely on treaty making. And you know, I think that is uh, as much a procedural question of legitimacy and questions of voice as it is just uh, uh, certain kinds of tensions as, as, as changes in the global economic cycle and the structure of the global economy are having disparate, uh, a, a disparate impact on, 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 on people. And I think that the question of legitimacy is key. Uh, uh, in a soft law world, uh, if you don't have a legitimate standard, if it's not viewed as legitimate uh, by the stakeholders, uh, the compliance pool, the bindingness of the agreement erodes because people will say, well, it's not a very legitimate agreement. If there's no enforcement power, then why do I have to listen to it? Um, at the same time, uh, uh, that problem on the back end that you see in a, in a soft law regime you see more on the front end when you get to a more formalized international system like the TPP, where you have to take a, a formal international agreement still relying on legislative processes and you have to push it through democratically elected individuals. If you don't have some signposts or recognition or a, a feeling that everyone has had their voice, then the legitimacy problem can stymie securing the agreement at all. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, so it, it leads to a, a, a series of problems um, that I think, you know, the architects of the new global economic order are going to have to grapple with. And lastly, you know, you, you see it even where goodwill is extremely high. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at the European Union today, I mean, these same questions of legitimacy uh, pervade a process where wholly democratically elected governments uh, have relied, where you've had um, uh, electorates themselves vote for certain kinds of agreements, and you still have at times intermittent crises of legitimacy that can stymie agreement and uh, productive uh, uh, cross-border economic and political cooperation. We've talked about legitimacy, participation, exclusion in the burgeoning new global economic order. What about the so-called rising powers of Brazil, Russia, India, and China? What's their current influence on the international economic order, and where do you see their influence playing out in the, over the near horizon? Yeah, Chris has talked a good bit about China, um, and the BRICS term, of course, was, was coined now uh, well, more than 
to 10 or 15 years ago, it may not be always the right way to look at it because Brazil's having a rough go economically at the moment. Russia has had a currency collapse and uh, the oil prices are down. Uh, but nonetheless, we're looking at a very different world order than we ever were before. Um, for most of the 1945 year, you know, present era, and certainly after the end of the Cold War, the United States could essentially define the terms of the international legal system generally and the international economic system in particular. And what we've seen since the early 2000s is that there are now more players at the table that are indispensable to any legal or economic agreement. Um, maybe it's the BRICS, maybe it's the G20, the group of 20 largest economies, maybe it's a group that's sometimes called the N11, the next 11 economies, whether that's Turkey and Nigeria um, uh, or in Mexico, but they're all, um, you know, very powerful and influential. What is particularly different, though, is that on some issues, they are now willing to assert a quite different vision of the international economic order. Uh, it's not that we all agree and they just sit at the table and, you know, say, okay, we're powerful and now we're, we're on board with you. And I want to give you a couple of, of quick examples of that. Um, one really clear example to me is the role of the state in international economic development. The Washington consensus, if you will, the basic sort of pr um, policy goals that the U.S had brought at the table were always about keeping government and the state out of the economy. It was about privatization and liberalization. And what you see from countries like China, India, Russia, and Brazil is a much more activist and interventionist state. It's a state that views itself as a protector of the economic system within the country, uh, often views poverty alleviation or wealth redistribution as part of its sort of goal in the economy. And whether it's in the structure of international investment law, the terms of international trade law, um, uh, agricultural protection and subsidies, you see these states saying, no, it is okay for national governments to play a far more interventionist role. And it's this different view of the role of the state that I think informs a lot of the tension that we start to see between the BRICS and sort of the U.S. and Europe uh, in the international economic space. Can I just jump in? Because yeah. I think that's, uh, it, it's, that is an extremely uh, useful and accurate observation. You know, and when I, in my work on the internationalization of the, of the renminbi, what's so fascinating is that when you look at the history of, of the internationalization of the dollar, you know, in, in, in a very real way, it was a market response to certain kinds of tax programs, <laughs> frankly, in the United States that were imposed. But it was a kind of bottom-up process, uh, an organic process that ultimately helped the U.S. dollar become uh, uh, the leading currency that is today. I mean, obviously, you did have certain forms of intervention, such as the Marshall Plan and other kinds of state-led uh, programs, but it wasn't for the purpose of promoting the internationalization of the dollar. It was usually in order to secure some kind of other uh, foreign policy necess uh, necessity. Uh, when you look at the way in which the internationalization of the renminbi is taking shape, you have really for the first time a major economy that is designating key market players. It's building its infrastructure from the top down as opposed to the bottom up. Uh, and, and it's creating players and relying on institutions with at times rather ambiguous relationships with the state. Now when you get to something like a financial market, it creates all kinds of questions. You know, um, What kind of liquidity backs up? What kinds of protection or bailout mechanism is there? What, what does this mean in terms of the equal treatment of a particular market participant not only in China, but uh, anywhere in the world when operating through that new developing infrastructure. And, you know, you know there are different, there are, there are both good and not so good reasons as to why they want to do it. I mean, you can make the argument that anytime a country internationalizes or open, opens up its currency, uh, you know, the, the, the likelihood of a major financial crisis or crash is very high. And so you want to make sure that you have enough speed bumps in place so as to secure a deliberate, safe internationalization process. But at the same time, you can also look at another uh, argument, which is that it's designed in order to promote uh, state interests or the interests of key uh, uh, state uh, market participants. And you know this creates all kinds of frictions, and it creates conversations that, again, when I talk about the transmission of regulatory policy, are going to bubble up. Uh, not only with China, but I think it, Bill is absolutely right when you look at uh, the kinds of, uh, of economic foreign strategy that's uh, uh, being adopted by 
uh, the other BRICS and uh, the other emerging economies that are starting to uh, 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 dominate uh, not just trade but also financial services. We've talked a lot about competition between the U.S. and China. I'm curious to know, just using the rising powers of Brazil, Russia, India, and, Ch India and China as example, as an example, how are the U.S. and EU dealing with these rising powers, both as as a collective, the BRICS, mm -hmm. that is, and individually? Yeah, so um, you know, the rising powers are, when we talk about the BRICS, sometimes we refer to them as the BRICS as if they were one entity, and they are not. Um, you know, if you look at, take China and Brazil, their economies are totally different. Their internationalization in terms of trade and engagement, totally different. So I think the first step is to say we got to take these economies as individuals. Um, and we also have to recognize that they are both economically and politically active. So sometimes they're acting out of the kind of economic interest we've been talking about. Sometimes, you know, Russia's invading Syria, and that's um, uh, maybe a political statement, not an economic one. So you have to unscramble also their foreign policy from their economic policy. Um, how are the U.S. and E.U. dealing with them? Well, not as well as, frankly, we should be. Um, uh, you know, the BRICS came together at the moment that the G8 um, was uh, sort of still running the world economy, if you will. And I think we were a little late in moving from the G8, the group of eight de democratic countries that sort of had like-minded values, to the G20, and then suddenly the BRICS popped up. And the BRICS meet now every year in a BRICS summit. It's a major summit for the five, uh, the four BRICS leaders and various others that they invite. Um, and every year they put out a big communique. And if you looked at the first communique, it was pretty thin. They didn't say very much. You get to the new communiques, and there's an awful lot of intergovernmental engagement looking for areas of common interest, areas to work together. Um, the most impressive of these recently is the creation of a new BRICS bank and fund. Um, this is essentially a BRIC-led version of the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and now the question, of course, is what does that thing do once it's created? Does it take the sort of Chinese uh, values and Chinese economic structures and export them? Uh, or does it What work? currency does yeah. it depend on? You know, uh, is, is going to be a big question. Uh, and, and does it work with the IMF and the World Bank? And I think the test for the U.S. and the EU is whether we can find places to really work with the BRICS and to get them to share some interests and values, um, or are we going to sort of say there, there's one model over here and another model and choose which you will. The key strategy for the U.S. and Europe has to be recognizing the different interests of the BRICS. If you go to India and talk to the Indians about the new BRIC bank and fund, they're very worried because they see it as a Chinese led endeavor. They may not want to go all in on it. You go to Brazil, they like the BRICS bank because it puts them at the global stage. But there's other ways to get them at the global stage. So the U.S. and Europe need to come together and then work to figure out where you can cooperate with the BRICS as a whole and where you cooperate with the individual countries where their interests align with those of the U.S. and Europe. I would certainly say that the Europeans have tended to have a different strategic posture towards many of these developments uh, than the United States. And I think it's only to be recognized, you know, the, the, the European project is still one about institution building in Europe. And the engagement with some of these countries can also offer, interestingly enough, opportunities for them to promote their own internal uh, regional institution building. Whereas in the United States, as for lack of a better word, as the incumbent uh, global superpower, has a different kind of stake in lots of these conversations. And as a result, it, it can tend to uh, diverge on certain policy issues uh, from the European Union uh, in important ways. And uh, you know, I think part of the uh, engagement by the West with the BRICS has to also be a kind of transatlantic engagement uh, where some of these differences are hashed out perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, delicately. So just to step back to the uh, original agreements we were talking about, the China-led agreement, the U.S.-led agreement, it, it, we're obviously in the early stages of these agreements, but what do you think the benefits are for citizens of the states that do participate in these agreements, and what are the implications for the global economy, um, again, in this early stage? Yeah, so... Um, I want to talk more about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, rather than the Chinese uh, agreement, because uh, this is our agreement and, and, and we know it and know how it's going to work. I think the benefits for the United States of America are enormous. Um, they're enormous because it gives the U.S. a chance to really take the lead on international trade in the future. They're enormous because it gives the U.S. the ability to define the terms and say, we believe in things like environmental protections, labor protections, and human rights 
rights protections as well as free trade, and that's critical. Um, it's also very important because it allows us to find new ways to engage key partners in the Asia-Pacific region. It finds common interests with Vietnam, with Chile, with um, Australia, with Japan, with Korea, and those are our key allies in the region, and it really brings us together. Um, you asked about citizens. About citizens, the answer is a little harder. Um, because free trade is good for the American economy, but it does create some displacement for some citizens. The good news is, and we're still waiting right now to see the actual text of the agreement, so we have to put that in there as a caveat, but what we expect to see is an agreement that really does create protections for American workers. That doesn't mean there won't be some people who are, suffer because of it, but the question is overall, will the American economy be stronger? Will America's place in the world be stronger? Absolutely. And then will we do enough to make sure that those people who are displaced uh, are able to find new ways to be a productive part of our economy and have nonetheless productive lives? Your thoughts, Chris? Well, you know, uh, uh, TPP and in particular TTIP, uh, the agreement with the Europeans. Now that one is still being negotiated, still right? We've gotten with, TPP, but the TTIP agreement with Europe is still and, a work and in, in many progress. ways, the, 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 the TTIP agreement was from a political standpoint, Europe. Uh, looking at this agreement and wanting to make sure that there was also a high level of engagement, of economic engagement with Europe, uh, and that the pivot to Asia wasn't going to leave them behind. Uh, but although the TTIP does, I think, underscore a very important point that, that, that Bill mentioned and that we've talked about before, is that these are, are, are economic agreements, but they're also foreign policy agreements. And, you know, really the, the number one issue now in foreign relations in most instances is the question of economic relationships. You know, what kind of trade relationship, what kind of uh, financial relationship are we going to have with other countries in the world, particularly as uh, uh, money and power and influence becomes spread a little bit more uh, broadly? And it's an important question. Uh, you know, I haven't seen the TPP text, and so it's, it's a little bit harder for me to uh, make an evaluation on the specifics, but let me say this. I think that uh, everyone recognizes that given the importance of economic relations, that you have to have a vehicle, if one will, uh, that will secure not only immediate benefits, but hopefully secure a glide path or a framework for further economic integration. Uh, so as to minimize frictions in foreign policy and the kinds of things that, frankly, can disturb the peace. And I think that from a foreign policy standpoint, uh, being able to secure a major Pacific Rim uh, uh, agreement, as well as a major transatlantic agreement, uh, helps to secure the country on a variety of levels, not only economic, but probably from a national security standpoint. Uh, you know, it is important, it is, it is vitally important that people get a say in the agreement. Um, uh, uh, you know, the impact will be disparate, likely. Uh, and you know, my view, and I've always been someone who's been sort of a proponent of internationalization, of globalization, of uh, America taking its traditional role at the forefront of the global economy and, 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 and leading vigorously. You know, I think that what complicates the question about sort of its impact is that Really, what happens to the United States isn't just a question of how we choose to engage the world, but it's also a question of basic choices that we're making here domestically. And how those choices, in terms of not just trade liberalization, but internationalization, dovetail with the kinds of steps that we have to take in order to keep our economy, on the one hand, more efficient, but also more fair. Um, and you know, I think the jury is out, particularly in this particular heated um, uh, moment, as to sort of what will be the configuration of our own of our domestic policy, uh, and uh, what I do like and what I've enjoyed uh, when I look at a lot of our trade agreements is that there's a lot of thought about securing these agreements not only as immediate wins on very important issues uh, uh, that could bolster our global and national economy, but also looking at them as uh, uh, templates upon which further levels of economic uh, uh, cooperation can be built. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's hopefully is going to be the legacy of a TPP or, or a TTIP. Uh, but again, that legacy is, is in turn going to be uh, informed by the kinds of decisions that we will ultimately make about how we decide to run our own economy. Well, we're talking about diplomacy. Let me make two quick points. One is to say, uh, we've talked a lot about China and Asia. Chris mentioned Europe and the, the TTIP agreement. 
We need to remember that the U.S. and Europe together are still the world's largest economic area, the most important trading area in the world, and so a free trade agreement with Europe has enormously powerful consequences for the United States, and frankly, Europe's also our key allies with our shared values, so that's really important. We've also talked about China as a potential threat and competition, and, and that if you're listening to this, you probably think some of these agreements and everything else, this is scary and it's dangerous. But the thing that really separates the U.S. and Chinese relationship from say, the Cold War with the Soviet Union back in the day, is the interdependence of our economies. That, you know, China maybe, you know, does things we don't like, but we're not going to war with China, and they're not going to go to war with us because we are absolutely dependent on one another. And it's these agreements and understanding them that really give us a powerfully strong relationship with China, even in moments of disagreement, because we're in this economy together and we need one another. You know, it, it does, though, you know, it, it is fascinating, the TTIP agreement. The fact that there is no sort of transatlantic trade agreement with our closest partners in and of itself really demonstrates um, uh, the fact that on both sides of Atlantic, perhaps our economic diplomacy hasn't been as effective as it perhaps uh, could have been. Uh, you know, I, I, I am intellectually uh, and sort of professionally more uh, involved in uh, sort of TTIP than the TPP, but from a conceptual standpoint, uh, uh, TTIP is and should be, in my opinion, a little bit more comfortable for a lot of Americans, in part because you're dealing with nothing but developed economies, uh, and also, again, they're countries with our shared values. And, uh, you know, the TTIP agreement is not as much about trade and tariffs as it is certain kinds of regulatory um, uh, uh, questions. You know, how do we choose to to manage core aspects of of our administrative state in order to secure an agreement in which we can export those standards, food safety, labor, and the like, to the rest of the world? And you know, uh, you know, I think part of again uh, our of our economic and political posture needs to be, in my own humble opinion, keeping that at the forefront and making sure that our negotiations with uh, or on a TTIP somehow inform and help to drive good outcomes on the TPP. And it shouldn't be the other way around. And I don't, I don't think it has been, but I think that uh, you know, process matters uh, and strategy matters. And I think that that's going to be something a lot of people are going to be keeping their eye out on. Professor Chris Brummer, Professor Bill Burke-White, thanks so much for just a great conversation. It certainly helped my understanding of the latest developments in, in the building blocks of international trade and finance. So thanks very much, both of you, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Case in Point.